Getting up, everybody, and coming to hear me. I really appreciate it. I'm just making sure my sound's good. Um, I am here on a new book I wrote called Silent Spring Revolution. And the origins of that book began really when I was a boy because my mother and father were teachers. And we had some, the one perk of being a teacher is you get some extra summertime. And we used our extra summertime as a family. We went all over the United States visiting our national parks and seashores. You know, I got to go to Yellowstone and Yosemite, the Olympics and the Everglades. Uh, we'd have a Pontiac and a, a, a station wagon and a trailer. I grew up in Northwest Ohio in the Midwest. And we would then just go see the country. And I had asthma as a boy and, um, and it was horrible. And wherever I went, I was so reinforced by picking up brochures like we used to do in those days. And on it, I would see that the place was saved by Theodore Roosevelt, who also had asthma as a boy and was suffer, would suffer mightily. So I identified with TR and I realized that he ended up, as I did more looking, saved 234 million acres, 234 million acres of wild America. He created today's U.S. Forest Service. Um, you know, he, all these Western National Forests are Theodore Roosevelt. He took uh, and created 51 federal bird reservations with the executive fiat. They showed him that birds were being slaughtered in Florida because there was a feathers war. Anybody coming to hear me speak between 19, let's just say circa 1900, would have come this morning, if you were a woman here, whether you think you would have or not, you would have come to hear a public lecture wearing a bonnet with an ornamental feather in it because there was a feather mafia in Florida and they'd gun all the birds down at the rookeries and they'd pluck the feathers and then they would also steal the eggs. And all of these species were dying. And nothing screams federal intervention more than certain environmental things. What good does it do for the Audubon Society of Massachusetts to say we're saving, you know, um, of bird species because of our progressive politics and a vigorous Audubon Society of Massachusetts just for those migratory birds to be shot willy-nilly and slaughtered in Florida? And the same is with air. It doesn't do any good with air quality to say we are Ohio and we have a stringent air quality. If where I grew up in Toledo, the factories of Detroit are blowing in dirt over the Ohio border. What do, what, you know, there has to be federal air quality and water quality on a river that goes through places and sewage treatments. None of this stuff, it, um, you know, it came until the book I wrote. But the point is, I wrote a book called The Wilderness Warrior, Theodore Roosevelt and the Crusade for America, all about that generation, what I call the first wave of environmentalism. It was conservation. There are differences, but for our brief purposes today, let's use the word environment. First reform wave, 1901-1909. It's the progressive era. Theodore Roosevelt, who said conservation and environmentalism is the number one concern of our country even above his great white fleet being built in the Navy. I wrote that book, and then I, when I did it, I said, there's one other thing. Franklin D. Roosevelt did it, too. I know you guys have all heard talks about Theodore Roosevelt or FDR, but I'm going to tell you one thing to know about him. Theodore Roosevelt was the state led to, went to Harvard. FDR went to Harvard. Theodore Roosevelt was a state legislature in New York, uh, FDR was state legislator in New York. Theodore Roosevelt was governor of New York. FDR was governor of New York. Theodore Roosevelt loved um, big Navy. That was his obsession. FDR had a big obsession with it. Theodore Roosevelt uh, said that conservation is the most important thing. FDR said conservation is the most important thing in his first New Deal Act was the Civilian Conservation Corps where unemployed Americans got paid a dollar a day and planted three billion trees across America because we had drained all of our wetlands. We have denuded all of our forest. We had taken uh, the uh, created a dust bowl ecological disaster all through the Great Plains West. But I should also add Theodore Roosevelt had a niece named Eleanor Roosevelt and FDR married her. They're tight. 
And when you deal with environmental conservation, those two presidents are where giants, and I wrote two books on them. So the book I'm here, Silent Spring Revolution, is about the third wave. And incidentally, FDR created 800 state parks, 800. Um, not, I can go into him saving Big Bend National Park on D-Day, which he did. He had all the D-Day maps of, of Big Bend, where visitor stations are going to be FDR, right while the, the, our soldiers were invading Normandy. Did not a game for the Roosevelt's environment conservation. But the third wave, I had to write, didn't have a figure like that. He didn't have a figure like FDR where whoever he filled out an application of what is his job, he'd write tree farmer. He sold Christmas trees out of his home. He was born along the Hudson River, uh, spent his life along the Hudson, and is buried on the Hudson, and really was the leader of what today we call the scenic Hudson River movement uh, to protect that beautiful, incredible waterway. Um, so my third wave, I had a, a problem at where to begin, who to focus on in this book. Um, and I ideally wanted to begin in 1960, John F. Kennedy's running for president, New Frontier. They, if you look at the Democratic plank that year, environments tucked in there pretty heavily, very firmly, because there was a feeling that, uh, a correct feeling, that Truman and Eisenhower didn't do enough on the um, national um, resources or parks environment. It was all boom, 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 post-war uh, industrialization, car culture, build it, build it, build it, and now Kennedy was gonna kind of be a timeout. Uh, Ansel Adams, the great California photographer, brought out his book in 60 called This is the American Earth. I could have milked that. Uh, Rachel Carson, who I'm going to mention in a minute, was writing, was a member of the new frontier of John F. Kennedy, writing environmental planks for the Democratic Party, being hosted by Ethel Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy's wife, by Jackie Kennedy hosting her. Uh, you know, so I thought I'd been in 60. I knew, though, where I was ending the book, because the third wave ended in 1973. Not even a question. It ended in 1973 with the triumph of the Endangered Species Act, passing the Senate 92 to nothing. So when you hear about this being liberal, it was American. And that same moment, almost to the week, the uh, of, of, of where endangered species was the big closing legislation of 73, we had the, the Arab oil embargo, OPEC. Uh, fear of gasoline prices, need for energy going high, energy independence, and a counter-revolution that developed immediately to stop Rachel Carsonism, Ralph Naderism, environmentalism that had gone too far. It went so far, the right said that Nixon had become a new dealer. <laughs> uh, and I'll mention why they thought that. Uh, but, you know, when, and out of that counter swing to what I'm about to tell you about was born the American Enterprise Institute, Heritage Foundation, Koch Brothers Industries, Scaifey Brothers, um, you know, um, it, it, all, any Federalist Society, they all are coming to save money. They don't like the federal government regulating them. It's an anti-federal regulation movement that emerges after the environmental movement starts petering out in 73. Now... I had to, instead of Kennedy, begin my book in 1945. I didn't want to. When I have people complain to me, they see how fat my book is. I know I could have begun it in 60 and gotten away with it. I would have been disingenuous. I would have been doing that to be a marketeer of books. But because the, the real history began in the days after World War II, once Hiroshima gets dropped, we talk about it as victory over Japan and the war has ended and we celebrate it and I would have been in the street celebrating it. I've never criticized Truman for his decision to drop the atomic bomb personally, but I never also criticized a lot of people I write in my book that said, whoa, what does this mean to the planet? The great Dr. Albert Schweitzer who won a Nobel Prize and man has, has just written his doom. If this nuclear genie starts going around the world, oh my God. And then, the, and then John Hershey of the New Yorker and other journalists started showing what radiation did to the people in Japan. Skin melting, uh, horror shows, 
of what, of what happens with an atomic bomb, and there became an anti-nuclear movement. But the anti-nuclear movement got fine-tuned to being anti-nuclear testing. The, there were, we were, on one level, policy people were American uh, Atomic Energy Commissioner deciding how do we stop other countries from getting nuclear bombs, all great. But there was a group of grassroots American citizens that became the first wave of the environmental movement that said, stop blowing nuclear weapons up in Nevada. From 1945 to 1992, the United States detonated 1,054 nuclear tests. Okay? Nevada. Boom, 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 boom. Do you think people in Nevada cared? Like, I'm getting radiation? No, they were doing, like, get your atomic shaker in, on Las Vegas where you could see it snowing radio fallout. People were doing the atomic cocktails. You know, do the um, nuclear boogie woogie. Because we were proud that we were a monopoly from 1945 to 1959. We're the only country in the world with nuclear weapons. We're it, USA. Then Russia gets the bomb. And then it's back and forth with the arms race. And meanwhile, we're testing, Russia's testing, and the planet suffers from it. Out of that anti-nuclear group comes a very funny coalition. The biggest leader is William O. Douglas, who be, I write about in the book, who became a, was FDR Supreme Court Justice, 1937. Douglas had rushed to say no Nagasaki. After he saw what it did in Hiroshima, the Supreme Court Justice said, don't drop one in Nagasaki. Justice would go and climb the Himalayans and become a, a Buddhist. Supreme Court Justice collecting Buddhism. His all-seasons hero is Henry David Thoreau. You know who else was against the mom? After the first one was dropped on Catholic moral reasons, Joseph Kennedy, who gets a lot of bad press for being a business guy, he wanted to get the Pope involved and bishops involved, Henry Luce involved, to make sure there wasn't a second bomb drop for moral implication reasons. But another one, so John F. Kennedy read PT-109, glad the war's over, but he immediately took to a writer named Norman Cousins, head of the Saturday Review, and Norman Cousins wrote the first book, big major essay called Is Man Obsolete Due to Nuclear Weapons? A critical, if you read it today, you'd say pretty mild. Uh, but nevertheless, he was saying this is not something we should be celebrating. It's a big problem. Kennedy loved it. Jack Kennedy, when you study, like I have closely his career in the Navy years, beyond being the legitimate hero, PT-109, was much more like Joseph Heller, Catch-22, Kurt Vonnegut, slaughterhouse kind of guy. He saw an absurdity of war. He saw an absurdity of how a chain of command things could go. And he was skeptical of the whole nuclear age. Yet he was an ardent cold warrior. Another person opposed to the atomic bomb was Rachel Carson. Uh, or about nuclear testing. Rachel Carson was from Pennsylvania a girl growing up on the banks of the Allegheny River, and the Allegheny River, guys, was a glue factories all around there. Dirty air, dirty river. It's a beautiful river in western Pennsylvania. She would go and collect pine cones and write about nature in her books. She put her first essay to get published in St. Nicholas Magazine, and a magazine for kids. And she talks about the natural world, about the atmosphere, and her teachers started recognizing in her, you have a gift for science and nature and literature. And so she goes to a school called Chatham, for, went school for women in Pittsburgh area, and decides she wants to be an oceanologist or ocean science person and had never seen an ocean, <laughs> even though she graduated from college. She got a fellowship to Woods Hole, Massachusetts, which is in walking distance from John F. Kennedy's home in Hyannisport. And Woods Hole, if you haven't heard about it, was the place if you wanted to study marine life. Today, here in La Jolla, you have University of California at San Diego with Scripps, or I live in Texas. We have a, a University of Texas has a marine center at Port Aransas in the Gulf of Mexico, or University of Miami's booming in marine science. But Woods Hole was where the intellectuals went. It was like the Advanced Institute in Princeton, where brainiacs go to study, you would go there to Woods Hole and you'd find, study the natural uh, sea world. She started studying the migratory patterns of eels. 
Because a lot of people do birds, but not a, there was no woman in the field of eels. And they do have remarkable journey eels from Africa all the way to the interior rivers of, of Pennsylvania. Um, and she started writing columns for the Baltimore Sun. She did an advanced degree in zoology at Johns Hopkins. She gets hired in World War II to write marine radio scripts for radio about our shad populations, our cod, fish stocks, and then fun pieces about sea urchins or ocean, ocean observations for radio. NPR kind of thing before NPR was born. And um, she's working for FDR, adores the New Deal. By 1946, she's writing a series called Conservation in Action, where those 51 first federal bird reservations that Theodore Roosevelt created are today's U.S. Fish and Wildlife refuges. You guys, you all here own 550 national wildlife refuges. They're all around you here. Love them. This is government at its best. It's protecting species, protecting oases. And, and for, we sometimes don't realize that th this is a great gift we got, these wildlife refuges. Um, but she was writing the, the little booklets for them to you know, tell if you went to go visit Sonny Bono National Wildlife Refuge. she tell you what birds you'd see there, what's going on in that uh, ecosystem? Great stuff. Um, but she got two clues about World War II being in government that worried her. One was the nuclear issue, and second, DDT. Because the other big advancement wasn't just the Manhattan Project in World War II. Another thing that won the war surely is the bomb. DDT pesticides. If you were young John F. Kennedy or Richard Nixon or Lyndon Johnson, anybody on the Pacific and Europe, but it made a big difference in the Pacific, you would have been doused with DDT, sprayed hosed. And I would have too, and you would have too. It killed lice, it kills mosquitoes, it kills ticks. It's a miracle. It helped us. We would take planes. A future environmentalist named Barry Commoner, in, uh, who was a genius, for World War II for our country invented the device that would spray DDT appropriately administered over vast islands in the Pacific so our troops wouldn't be attacked with malaria. Problem is, Rachel Carson being in government working that U.S. Fish and Wildlife beat, particularly at Paul Tucks in Maryland, where we have a national, you guys own a National Wildlife Research Center where we test all chemicals on waterways and airs to see what, how it affects wildlife, meaning how it might affect us soon. And she knew DDT was toxic to fish and birds. She had read reams of data, documents piled. And so she decided she was going to kind of be a whistleblower, wanted to go public with Ray, uh, uh, Reader's Digest, and they rejected her. They said, no way. Why? DDT was big business. It was bought by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Every farm in the United States was being sprayed with pesticides. It was considered a miracle. It was as big a powerful lobby of the chemical industry as oil and gas lobby today. It was huge. And so she got flummoxed, and Rachel Carson instead wrote three sea books. If none of you have read her sea trilogy, three books about the sea, my favorite being called The Sea Around Us, but I love all three, you can get them in a convenient Library of America book, one volume. I highly recommend it. Nobody writes about ocean conservation, the world of the ocean, with the grace notes of Rachel Carson as a literary person. So there, in my mind, there's Henry David Thoreau and Rachel Carson. Um, and, and when you're really getting into how to write about a natural um, area. The, uh, in extent, her writing is much more, more, it's like two levels advanced than a National Geographic writing or something. It's really special. Uh, and one of her big fans were the Kennedy families. They loved her books, particularly Rose Kennedy. Do you know John F. Kennedy's mother grew up in Concord, Massachusetts, swimming, picnicking, and Walden Pond every day? The Kennedy kids did not learn to swim in the ocean. They learned to swim in Walden Pond. Did you realize that John F. Kennedy's mother made a mission to Russia to investigate whether Thoreau's collected works were in the libraries in Russia? Do you realize that her favorite book beyond an essay walking by Thoreau and Walden was a book called Cape Cod, all about the Outer Cape, the Outer Cape that her son John F. Kennedy would sign as the Cape Cod National Seashore in 1961? And, and, uh, and when I say national seashores, guys, when Kennedy became president, we had one, Cape Hatteras. It's 
hard ones are on coastal areas. I, if I were president or Jimmy Carter was president, he saved a lot. People say he saved this many acres in Alaska. It's mountain rock. The, you know, uh, here's, a, here's a big, you know what Kennedy sold? I'm not criticizing that. I'm simply saying for the politics of it. Bob, a great reporter here, knows these politics. Kennedy actually got through seashore real estate for public parks like Cape Cod, like Padre Island, Texas, like Point Reyes, California, Marin. If you go there now, there's all John F. Kennedy seashores because Kennedy had read Rachel Carson. Rose is a fanatic. The book they loved was a book, an undersung book by Henry David Thoreau called Cape Cod. That book was a, a, helped create Cape Cod National Seashore that many decades after his death. And, um, and in the mid-50s, the government came up with a report called Our Vanishing Shorelines. And in that report said public beach is disappearing. Everybody's building condos, or that wasn't the word, but apartments, hotels, uh, jerseyization, um, dredging. And we're going to have no open public seashore lands for the public to enjoy. And, and that movement, Kennedy seized on as this one big conservation thing. So you've got this seashore conservation going in the 50s, early 60s. You've got the anti-bomb stop testing in Nevada. People are getting sick. And DDT. And out of the DDT group, a big thing happens. A woman named Marjorie Spock. How many of you here have ever heard of Dr. Benjamin Spock? The baby doctor turned anti-war protester. The baby doctor, Benjamin Spock's sister, Marjorie Spock, was an organic farmer. She had a vast part of Suffolk County, New York, as an organic farm. Ahead of her time, today there's Whole Foods on every corner of any place you go. But she was mar wanted to market to her only organic because she thought all these chemicals we were putting in our foodstuffs wasn't good. Fair. Problem was. They were blanket spraying DDT over her property. Uh, and so she claimed, my right as an organic farmer has just been taken away from me. Constitutional right. Leave me alone. It's my land. I want to grow organic produce. If any of you went to law school or have a grandkid in law school or think, of, it's a great idea. I had never thought, like, what is, what do I own up above me? How many feet do I have to go when I am not in control? I mean, it's interesting. Just, and so I don't, I don't think it's frivolous, and it made it its way to the Supreme Court, like it should have. And in the Supreme Court, they voted Marjorie Spock down. She lost. But William O. Douglas grabbed onto it and wrote a dissent published in Reader Digest and everywhere that's the birth of environmental law. He triggers the environmental movement with his dissent. And now, by, not only when he got to hike the Himalayas and write a book about it, but Bill Douglas in, was writing books called My Wilderness. He wrote two books called My Wilderness, where he tramp all around the country. And if you're in Washington, D.C., Bob, you're up there, and, 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 and others, that, you, you got, go to the CNO Canal, you might meet the bus to Bill Douglas. But William O. Douglas hiked 186 miles down the whole, you know, because they were going to build a road there, highway. He said it's a scenic, cultural, and history resource. But he put it, he marched 186 miles because the Washington Post said build the highway. And he wrote, the Post said, come with me. If you hike with me and you still want to build the highway, great. But if you let me show you what you will do, destroy, and to the post editor's credit, they went with him. They didn't do the whole 186 miles. But they at least went with the justice to see what he's talking about. And they said, yeah, we got to come up with something different here. We don't want to destroy the CNO Canal. He won Douglas. He, said, he won his fight. The post backed down. And today it's part of the National Park Service. No road. It got saved. Oh, man, that's all Douglas needed. He became an environmental activist. I chuckle when I turn on the TV and hear about Supreme or Clarence Thomas or uh, conflicts of interest. Whoa, Bill Douglas was a walking conflict of interest. His office in the Supreme Court was the clearinghouse for anything environmental in the country before there was an EPA. The EPA is not created in 1970. 
there was nowhere to go. If you had an environmental problem out here in the in Rancho Mirage or Palm Springs and you're getting flummoxed, not getting action in Sacramento, you might send a postcard to Douglas. And he'd respond. And he'd, he'd say, give me every document, every information you can. People, these green grassroots groups all the country start sending Douglas reams of their data about what's going on in local places. And Douglas would farm it out to... David Brower at the Sierra Club or Will, uh, Howard Zonizer at the Wilderness Society. And then Douglas kept hiking and hiking. He hiked in, in um, Kentucky to stop a dam and he won. He hiked with Bobby and Ethel Kennedy along the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State and won. No road. He went to the Buffalo River in Arkansas, beautiful river where the protest was so big, people were putting barbed wire across the river so canoes or kayakers would get entangled there were shootings going on, and there's Bill Douglas canoeing down the buffalo. Now, I didn't say he's a great Supreme Court justice, okay? <laughs> okay. You got to just telling you this is what, what his life was about. That He didn't like lawyers or law clerks. He was very mean to Supreme Court. So he's complicated, but not on the environmental issue. He was a believer in a deep way, and he won. He showed the Greens get guts, get out there, protest, and we can win. And we won the Buffalo. Richard Nixon saved the Buffalo River uh, from being dammed. Uh, I can go on with Douglas's stunts that all work. He doesn't have a failure on these things. Uh, he brings so much media attention to it. Um, and he backs Rachel Carson, who now, after Spock loses, Spock sends Rachel Carson, here's all of the legal information. Douglas sends her every dirty document he could find on DDT, chemical industries. Douglas writes a friend in writing, I am going to bend the law against the corporation in favor of the environment. He's going to bend the law against the corporation. Well, he, well, how do you feel about it? That's, that's all. That's guts. Man. He's like, right, he's in that zone. You know, do you think Dr. King's the only one protesting? Uh, um, and Dr. King, incidentally, on DDT, in particular on the nuclear test, Martin Luther King Jr. said over and over again, what good does it do to integrate the Greenville lunch counter, or I mean Greenboro, Greensboro lunch counter in North Carolina, what good does it do to integrate a lunch counter if the milk you're drinking has got stardium 90 in it? Because the fallout was going across America. The hard rain. Barry Commoner, whose name I casually mentioned at Washington University, was collecting baby teeth samples and showing kids exposed to radiation and who weren't. Um, but Rachel Carson grabs all of the legal stuff, and then she's got all of her whistleblowers at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Research Labs giving her all their anti-DDT info. And she sits down and writes in the late 50s, Silent Spring, a book that comes out in 1962 and is a, a one-book revolution with Douglas spurring it on. Because in that book, uh, Ray, well, first of all, Rachel Carson had cancer, breast cancer, while she was writing it. She lost all of her hair, going through radiation treatments, knew she was gonna be dead soon, and was working against the clock to get her writing done. When it gets done in January 60, Bill Douglas says, I'll, I'll get the Kennedys on board. You know, Bill Douglas was really close to the Kennedy family. I, I can't tell you how close. He took Bobby Kennedy, the attorney general, as a boy hiking all in Siberia to see Siberia. They hiked all over Siberia. Bobby Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, and not the one of today, the original. Robert F. Kennedy and Bill Douglas went all over Siberia. And Bobby Kennedy, uh, Ethel Kennedy told me Bobby got high fever, really high, like 104 in the middle of the outbank of Siberia, sweating, sick. They were looking for, so they, they couldn't find a penicillin or any kind of medicine or what could help him. And Douglas, being a man of Darwin, put on his backpack and said, you're sick, Bobby, this is where we part company. And continued on his hike. <laughs> And left Bobby there to his own fate, his own Darwinian fate. <laughs> Ethel told me she wouldn't talk to Bill Douglas for about five years. She was so pissed that he left her husband in that state. Bobby Kennedy loved it. Like he came back, oh, Bill left me, ha, 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 you know, kind of macho thing. But, uh, but uh, he never held it against him, but she did. Um, but point is, Douglas told Rachel, we're going to do this, man. You're going to be under attack, but we got your back. Her articles get published in the New Yorker in June of 62. 
causes holy hell because the chemical industry is not just worried about getting rid of DDT. They're seeing this as a trick to do hyper federal regulation on any chemical. And what are you dumping in rivers? Where is your chemical waste going? This is the big takedown. So they got to take Carson down. They call her every name in the book, particularly sexual smears because she had never married, uh, a spinster, blah, blah. I, I won't even say them. They're so ugly. But it was intense. And Kennedy, to his credit, as a pony, and when asked by press, he said, oh, yeah, I've, I've read Miss Carson, and we're going to get we're going to get to the results uh, of her, Ms. Ms. Carson's book and all, and we're going to find out. I'm going to put a panel together. He puts a top group of panel, MIT types, you know, boom. What, is Carson right or is the chemical company right? Carson was right. And the, and the, the DDT wars come. It goes on for 10 years with big chemicals saying, no, we're, we can't lose this battle. Rachel Carson dies in 64. Kennedy's dead in 63. The DDT battle doesn't end until 1972. And you know who's the one who finally abolished us using DDT in the U.S.? Richard Nixon. He didn't want to, but his first EPA head, William Ruckel's house, stood up really strong and told Nixon, you pointed me at an EPA. I've looked at all this stuff, and we can't use it anymore. And Nixon said, oh, I'm gonna, you go. he was really livid about it, Nixon, to be honest. To be fair, he did it. He was angry because I'm going to lose the ranchers. You know, I'm going to lose the, you know, he's worried politically with the cost on his side. Um, but he did it, Nixon. Um, and after that, the revolution kicks in. And the big key for Kennedy had picked a man, Stuart Udall, as Secretary of Interior, our finest ever. Uh, during these years, we get things like Canyonlands National Park created in Utah. Big battle for the North Cascades and Washington State National Park. California was ground zero in my book on a lot of this stuff. For example, the Battle of Bodega Bay. I don't know how you care or think about nuclear power, because it depends on my mood sometimes. Um, but it, and I understand the complications of, of all of that with anything nuclear. But I will tell you what shot it down really, really um, it was that the Pacific, your electric company, Pacific, uh, um, California Electric Company, wanted to build the world's biggest atomic campus on, um, on, uh, at Bodega Bay, California, on the San Andreas Fault. <laughs> Boneheaded. They could have found so many other sites, and they decided to build it right on the ocean along where they would hit the fault line. And, and, they, it, and the public went nuts. The Sierra Club went nuts. But, but suddenly Udall and everybody says no. They Again, it's the victories of this third wave. They're winning. They're winning battles. They might have a setback like in the Supreme Court, but then they win. And they're tenacious. And it's coming from all walks of life. Before I do away with Kennedy, um, let me tell you um, that Kennedy did one of the great ecological events in world history. The nuclear test ban treaty. You know how we stopped testing weapons in Nevada? It's because Kennedy sent Norman, first off, Kennedy sent Norman Cousins, this fringe writer who wrote when Kennedy was in the military uniform that weapons, should, nuclear weapons are a problem. He sends secret behind CIA state defenses back Norman Cousins to meet the Pope as a fig leaf of where he's headed and then go meet Khrushchev. It's a third party dip dip diplomacy of extraordinary kinds. Cousins starts brokering a deal for a nuclear test ban after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Kennedy, starting with a great speech at American University, but in the summer of 63, said, no, sign a deal with Russia and Britain, no more atmospheric or underwater testing. Russia today cannot blow up nuclear weapons and test them, okay? They're because of Kennedy's treaty. Now, it did allow underground testing. It's another story. But the point is, Kennedy did something in the foreign policy Cold War realm that's meaningful. And Ted Sorensen, his speechwriter, said it's the greatest. Kennedy saw it as his greatest achievement. Not the moon, going to the moon, and this is thought. He thought, Kennedy, that stopping the testing of nuclear weapons was his greatest achievement. Now, Lyndon Johnson comes in, and the, the, if you want to call them the old New Dealers or the Bill Douglas um, radicals or whatever you want to call them, 
Um, the you know, proto-environmentalist is often used today. Uh, but what they were worried about is Lyndon Johnson. Because Lyndon had fought against the big seashore battle in Texas over Padre Island. Lyndon Johnson wanted to develop it with condos and hotels. And uh, so they were suspicious of Lyndon. On the other hand, uh, he loved FDR and he loved Theodore Roosevelt and he's married to Lady Bird. And from 63 to the end of his presidency, Lyndon Johnson was a first-rate conservation president. Problem with Johnson is he thought of conservation as America, saving America the beautiful. Lyndon Johnson, for example, signs the Wild and Scenic River Act, stopping beautiful rivers from being dammed. Today, we all own these incredible wild and scenic rivers that weren't room because of Lyndon. He did the, if you go to the Appalachian Trail system or the Pacific Crest Trail out here, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he did the Wilderness Act. Well, that's the Wilderness Act. If you look at a map, you'll see big parts of wilderness, million acres where no roads are allowed to be built. The Wilderness Act was born in 1935, and our first wilderness unit is Kings Canyon, parts of Kings Canyon National Park here in California. And that's Harold Ickes doing in Ansel Adams's. They got to FDR. Uh, the big thing Eleanor used to say to environmental people, Eleanor said, she bring pictures. If you show Franklin a beautiful landscape, he'll say, save it. She was so right. These guys brought all these beautiful pictures, and they wanted over, over a million acres with no roads, nothing as a primitive wilderness in the Sierras. And one of the great lines ever, FDR looked at the picture, said, oh, my God, because he loved it. This was early in Adams, and FDR got his genius. I mean, he saw what a young genius this guy was with the camera. And he said, you know, the thing is, guys, I'll never be able to see it meaning I'm in a wheelchair. If I block it off, no roads, no visitor centers, how will I ever see all these beautiful sights you're showing me? What do you say to that? And he said, oh, well, and then he signed it. <laughs> and that started the wilderness movement. And by 64, Lyndon Johnson signs the Wilderness Act, puts 9.1 million acres of America aside for no roads because roads bring logging, roads bring electricity, roads bring incursion, incursions from civilization and you can never get man out of nature guys there's something in the water that we did there's something flying overhead so it's kind of frontier idealism wilderness but we do it and we've got big parcels of it. johnson ladybird you all must know wildflowers beautification she came out here for the road at big sur in a ceremony to have scenic roads without billboards along pacific coast highway you know, she went with Stuart Udall down the Rio Grande River at Big Bend. She went rafting, whitewater rafting in the Snake River and all in Idaho, on and on. She is our conservation beautification. She wanted to call it environmentalism, and she said, Linden boys wouldn't let me. They, they wanted the word beautification, and she said, I hate it. It sounds like a, a mortician or something putting on a, a, a lipstick on a corpse or something. She didn't like it, but she got stuck with the term beautification because environmental was starting to be seen as a campus left buzzword um, re and replacing ecology. Um, but they did good. They did good work. And it's unfortunate the Vietnam War has clouded. We, we, we have celebrated Lyndon on civil rights and Head Start and NPR and Phoebe. He was a very good conservation president, and she was the amazing first lady. Nixon. You might say, how does Nixon fit in? Nixon ran in 1968 president. You all know that. California, you got to know about the environment a little bit, no matter what you think out here. It's everywhere. You have people arguing it. But do you realize that Nixon, um, in asking, getting asked environmental questions he can't answer? Do you realize that Nixon um, hires John Ehrlichman, who goes to prison for Watergate, most known, who was a land water lawyer from Seattle? And Nixon went up there and went boating with him once and came back and said, you know, Ehrlichman's really smart. He's making money on NIMBY, not in my backyard. Rich people not wanting an aluminum factory next to them. They'd hire, hire Ehrlichman's firm and they'd win. And so he became the de facto environmentalist for Nixon. Uh, the Sierra Club calls him a covert green. Um, however, he felt on other issues, he was in with the environmental crowd, Ehrlichman, and he goes to the White House, and, and to be fair to Nixon, he's president in days, guys, just days, I think it's eight days. And the Santa Barbara oil spill happens. 
Now, television turned color the nightly news in 67. You know, Cronkite and all went color 67. This is January 69, and Nixon's not even in his office pr practically, and the whole TV showing birds goo. In fact, the organization in Santa Barbara get the oil out, goo. The birds trapped in oil, the blue, a paradise of Santa Barbara despoiled. Wealthy Republican donors to Nixon who lived along the coast of California writing Nixon letters, do something. And Nixon flew out. He had an interior secretary, Walter Hicker, Hickel, who told him the exact right um, thing, Hickel. He said, don't minimize it. Don't tell people how bad it is. Do not minimize, because it's bad. And just say it's bad and we'll blame Johnson. <laughs> uh, and so Nixon did, and he came on and did it. But he wasn't sure how to play environmentalism. And in the summer of 69, when he's ready to celebrate Neil Armstrong on the moon, Nixon talking to the astronauts, Time Magazine's putting Cuyahoga River on fire in Ohio and the Rouge River on fire. That means, guys, you take a match and put it, and it goes, Pow! And this starts talking about how sick our rivers are. Remember, there's no EPA, okay? You got no Clean Water Act yet. And, um, and, and so that's going on. And uh, Gaylord Nelson, senator from Wisconsin, the father as of Apostle Islands National Park, the, father, the conceptualizer of Earth Day, 1970, our first Earth Day, he goes and, um, and, and, and Nelson comes up with the idea of a teach-in for Earth Day about the environment. Now, I've read all these books, and I've, I, after I've read Earth Day books, first one, the whole country, da, da, but I saw they had offices everywhere. How does somebody in November have no offices and in April has offices everywhere for an Earth Day? Follow the money, right? Where did that money come from? And you won't believe where it all comes from. Not some of it, not a hunk, a grant. And it's not Bill Douglas. He was always pretty poor. It comes from Walter Ruther of the United Automobile Workers. Ruther funds Earth Day because big labor and big environment were in tandem. Because Ruther, who dies days after Earth Day in a weird plane crash with his wife May, Ruther said, blue collar workers, we can't go to Yosemite. I want the local Detroit, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, where our workers are. We want clean lakes, fishing, hunting. Uh, beaches, local. We want, we want to clean. He, he, so he was a real environmentalist, Ruther. You're starting to see uh, my times. What, what time do I have to end? I'm a college lecturer, guys. You've got to forgive me. We go on. Two minutes. Um, the, the, uh, the key here then becomes uh, with that Earth Day. Now, Nixon is starting to see, holy God, this Earth Day is really growing. And Ruther's paying for everything. This thing's, I'm getting, I don't want to be the butt. Nixon was just paranoid of not being the, the, the polluter. And he does something really smart. He makes a deal with Ehrlichman. He says to John Ehrlichman, you're, you're a greenie. You know, you're in with these guys. I will sign what you guys produce with Democrats if it's got Scoop Jackson's office does it. I will not if Muskie, if Muskie, Ed Muskie of Maine, has anything to do with it. I'm, I'm off. So Ehrlichman, this is the triumph of the Seattle people. Ehrlichman and Scoop Jackson's teams get together, and they, they cobble together NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act. If you don't know about NEPA, you're living it. This library wouldn't have been built without NEPA. NEPA, signed by Nixon, January 1st, 1970, in San Clemente, California, at the Western White House, before the football games come on. Shocking the press gaggle following him. He cites NEPA, which makes environmental impact statements for construction, mandatory real estate, commercial development, blah, 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 blah. But what does that do, guys, when you sign NEPA? It guarantees environmental law to be a boom industry. I have my students at Rice University, they're not, not, not majoring in environment often uh, to go work for the Sierra Club or Audubon. So a lot of times they're getting hired by ExxonMobil to be an environmentalist, making environmental impact statements. But it creates environmental law, which is going to lead us to where the fourth wave's coming with climate change. Uh, and in my dwindling time, I will tell you, Earth Day, Nixon decides to split the difference. He gives Interior Department staff the day off to teach people about Earth. 
He plants a tree on the White House with Pat Nixon. Good photo op. So he did something, tree planting, legit. Uh, uh, and has the FBI do deep surveillance on the Earth Day headquarters and the, and, and the protesters. Nixon says they're pinko commies. I'm worried that this is a Ruther socialist plot and it's aimed to make me look bad. And so Ehrlichman and Ruckelshaus people uh, go, in the, one of the funnier memos, we, we read, historians read other people's mail for a living. One of the funniest letters is with er Ehrlichman and Ruckels, uh, Ehrlichman and Pete McCluskey out here in California, a former Republican, moderate, environmental congressman. Um, he's, they're good friends, Ehrlichman and Pete. And he says, Pete, you won't believe what the FBI's come up with. There was nothing nefarious. It was some uh, girls not wearing bras. There was a little bit of smooching going on under trees. There were some dogs running. There are frisbees. <laughs> he said, it's the most benign surveillance report they've ever seen. They're dying. But he tells McCluskey, but now you, I, I know you may find this funny, but I've got to go tell the boss this, you know. And... Um, and Nixon's like, after he survives Earth Day in the summer of 1970, he sees the environment's a winning issue. He had made it a plank of his 1970 State of the Union. It, I think it's a third of the speeches on the environment by Nixon, January 70. Summer of 70, he creates the Environmental Protection Agency out of the White House with the help of Scoop Jackson and John Dingell on the Democratic side. But they get together, they get the language, they streamline it all, it opens the doors December 70. William Ruckel's house becomes the first head of the EPA, and he's a badass cop. I'm telling you, Ruckel's house knew, and he, we should name the, the EPA the Ruckel's house building. One of the most honest public servants I've ever encountered, and I got to know him well. I did his oral histories for University of Washington, Washington State. Ruckel's house had the hard job. You guys, I'll end with this. Do you guys know how Brown versus Topeka? It wasn't just about the legislation. Uh, separate but equal is no good now. You've got to integrate the schools. What is the whole civil rights movement? It's about making the people complying to Brown. You go to Little Rock in 57, are you complying to the Brown decision? You go to France Elementary School in New Orleans with Ruby Bridges, are you complying? Ruckel's house is the burden of telling polluting companies, extraction industries, chemical industries, we're busting you. The feds are busting you. You're not, apply, you're not following EPA standards or NEPA. Or the Clean Air Act, which Nixon signs in 1970. And soon to be the Clean Water Act of 1972. And so by the time Nixon leaves, the, it was the end of a revolution that was bipartisan in spirit. It had Republicans, Nixon, Ruckel's house, Russell, a guy named Russell Train who helped create the World Wildlife Fund. On the Republican side, John Salyer, Republican congressman, McClowski here. It had Frank Church and, and Gaylord Nelson and real environmental senators. It had Supreme Court Justice Douglas. It had anti-nuke um, people like Coretta Scott King, Dr. King. Bobby Kennedy was a, per, a poster boy for wild and scenic rivers going around uh, to rafting with the Kennedy family to save our rivers. And dams, which once were popular, became unpopular. The big showdown was the Grand Canyon and the Sierra Club, thanks to David Brower, would take out full page ads in the New York Times since, right, that said, would you flood the Sistine Chapel? And th th once that was another environmental victory, we're waiting for the fourth wave right now, which has to be global. It's gonna start by Generation Z. And the baby boomers do not need to feel bad by in infusing our curriculum with terms like earth science, ecology, Earth Day, studying environment and endangered species. We feel like we're losing, but we've educated a planet that we need planetary conservation action. I thought when Al Gore did Inconvenient Truth, it might be going on. He's had about seven Republican senators. Alas, we're not there yet. But there will be a new one in California very well may be the leader of the fourth wave because of their rules on uh, getting fossil fuels um, uh, with uh, no selling of fossil fuel cars by 2035. Thank you all.